Good evening, everybody. Can I have your attention? Okay, I hope everybody had a wonderful dinner and I hope everybody has enjoyed their time at Munsa so far. Our conference is almost over, but we have a great presentation and a great speaker um, who has offered to speak for us today. So, um, our guest speaker, Don Sheehan, has an extensive career in foreign relations uh, with the State Department and he has graciously offered to share with us some of the valuable lessons he learned about diplomacy along the way. So I'll hand it off to you, Don. Thank you. Okay. You know, I thank you for that. Uh, undeserved applause, but what I'll say is actually I want to applaud you all for doing what you're doing and for having achieved something pretty remarkable for high school students to organize and run as I understand it, the largest model UN conference in the United States to include uh, with linkages to schools in Mexico. So the first thing I have to say to you guys is you deserve a round of applause yourselves. Because more than anything else, I have to say students who take an interest in foreign affairs, you're already ahead of your peers. You, you, you have an interest in other countries, other cultures, uh, other means of education, other achievements. And that's critical because what I've told other students before, you guys sort of serve as double ambassadors. And what I mean by that is you not only get to go abroad and explain the United States to other countries, because they're always intrigued. They want to know, what's, you know what craziness are we up to now. But it's also what you bring back to your families. And because you cannot underestimate how many Americans have absolutely no real knowledge of foreign affairs or foreign history. I mean, uh, the stats that I remember most is that only 20% of the US population actually has or, or has at least had a US passport. And I'm kind of curious how many of you all have passports here? You see, you're already ahead of the pack. <laughs> so I would say to you, look, look at what you've accomplished and look at what you're accomplishing even now. These are skills that will do you well in any profession, in, uh, in any career you so choose in the future. And foreign affairs is basically public service. Your job is to help countries understand one another come to agreement on things together, uh, resolve disputes, hopefully uh, amicably or without rancor. And your, your job at the same time is to take care of your home country's citizens, public service. Um, I, I have to say, when you're a diplomat abroad, you're not just a diplomat for you know, uh, going you know, to country A or country B. You're there to represent both the president, the 50 different states, our Congress. I mean, we in the State Department sometimes jokingly say we don't have uh, one Secretary of State. We have 536 Secretaries of State. And I mean by that, that you have one Secretary of State and 535 members of Congress. The other thing is, you know, when we represent those 50 different states, you have to be able to explain those differences to other countries. Like, what, what does it mean to come from New York versus California versus Florida versus Georgia? Um, the multiple histories that we have. You're also representing the fact that this country, it's expensive, but it has rule of law. You actually have a court system that is and is designed to be independent. And so these skills are, as, as, as part of diplomacy and as part of your learning, uh, will do you well no matter where you go, no matter what profession you choose, and the interests that you have in the future, okay? Um, but let's move on, and I'll start doing the slides. And uh, to quote the divine Miss Bette Midler, uh, enough about you, let's talk about me. So my background. Number one, I'm a foreign service brat. That means my father was a diplomat, uh, my sister uh, was a diplomat, 
And you can't, you don't get in by, uh, by family relations. You get in because you have to pass a test. And at the bottom of that slide, when I say my middle name is P for persistence, I'll just share with you is I took that far ser foreign service exam, the written exam, seven times, and I failed the first six. <laughs> and uh, so... <laughs> And it only happened when I turned 36. You see how young I was then? Um, and uh, I can honestly say it was a great relief when I finally passed that damn exam. Um, background, I, you know, the, and this is one thing that I'm gonna say to you guys, the benefit of education. I had the benefit of a good education and I did go to Georgetown University. I did happen to go to the School of Foreign Service. Um, I would, but I chose Georgetown not so much for the School of Foreign Service, I chose it because so, so many foreign policy leaders and U.S. national leaders come to Georgetown to actually give spe you know, speeches and presentations. So I had a great time learning at the same time, hoping someday maybe to get involved in the Foreign Service. I had the benefit also of getting an MBA that helped me uh, in terms of uh, international relations because I did international finance. And prior to that, uh, of getting into uh, the State Department, I was in the Army for six years. Um, I never really planned to be in the Army. I did ROTC in college and uh, to pay my way through college. But it benefited me a great deal because the military, my military background taught me how to communicate and by that I mean, sometimes in diplomacy or other matters, you have to use nuance or you have to not necessarily be harsh. Well, the military, they're very, very clear cut in their commo, their communications. And a yes is a yes, a no is a no, a maybe is a maybe, and I don't know means I don't know. And I found that to be extremely uh, helpful in my own career subsequently. I have since served in a number of places, very diverse, uh, Poland, Tunisia, um, back in Washington as well. My father once said to me, uh, if you will, one diplomat to another, he said, you know, Don, actually the best diplomatic lessons you're gonna learn are in Washington, D.C. itself, learning to work with your other interagency partners. That means State Department working with commerce, working with EPA, working with CIA, working with the Defense Department. So I found that I benefited greatly both from multilateral and bilateral diplomacy by the work I did both in DC and abroad. And I did serve in Afghanistan uh, two tours, uh, two separate times of one was for one year and the other was for two years. And there I was working directly with our military as well as our NATO allies in trying to to stand up the Afghan uh, National Security Forces. Um, another background aspect is that it was ironic. My father's first assignment was to Poland back in 1968, long before you guys were born. And uh, 25 years later, I found out my first assignment was gonna be Poland too, which was really, tr trust me, very ironic. For the skills you're gonna need, I can honestly emphasize, if you can't write well, uh, go learn. Uh, writing well, writing concisely, being able to summarize enormous amounts of data into two pages for principals to read, that's what you're doing. Your job is to provide the information that they need to do the job that they need to do, which is make decisions and direct policy for the United States. So, uh, writing, your ability to do, take it, to analyze material and reduce it to its concrete core, and then being able also to defend it, explain it, public speaking, and last but not least, having the integrity to know that it's an honor to represent your country abroad. I also encourage you to stay intellectually curious throughout your life because you never can benefit unless you keep learning. You have to keep, you know, the day's wasted when you don't learn something new. Next slide, please. There you have some examples of both multilateral diplomacy and bilateral. You guys just learned it, doing your negotiations, coming to agreement, trying to figure out how do we get to yes. Multilateral diplomacy is a lot slower, 
a lot more complicated because you're taking into account all the sovereign nation's different interests. What might be important to France might not be important to the United Kingdom, and what might be important to Morocco might not be something that Algeria really wants to encourage. There's, those are bilateral issues, but then when you have multilateral, how do you come together on agreement? NATO, for example, every country is independent and sovereign. All decisions have to be unanimous. Same thing for the European Union. That's why they have what are called uh, EU council meetings, it's where foreign ministers meet, or they have what are called summits, and that's where the leaders of the nations come together directly. I mean, the, the purpose of any diplomat is to advance your national interest. It's to represent your country in a way so that the, whatever your national interests are, you're moving them forward and taking into account other countries' interests too. But sometimes you might be diametrically opposed. But the thing is, that's what your job is to do, is to negotiate, to talk, to exchange ideas, and help them to understand your side. Um, they used to say in the, the, the difference between a military officer and a foreign policy officer is the military, they jokingly say, is sent abroad to die for their country, whereas the foreign policy officer is sent abroad to dine for his country. So sometimes dinners can be very beneficial. Let's go to the next slide. There you go. The art of diplomacy is learning how to let the other guy have your way. When you can persuade the other guy to come up with your idea and you give him or her the credit for it, you now advanced your national interest while at the same time bringing in a partner who supports what you're trying to do. I had that happen when I, did, I had to negotiate text at NATO, is sometimes trying to persuade uh, other countries to accept a certain, let's say, a phrase. We were, coming to, we were trying to do a communique on Russia, a NATO communique on Russia, because we were meeting, uh, the NATO Secretary General was meeting the Russian Prime Minister. So in a communique, sometimes you can argue over a verb. You can get tied in knots over a simple verb. But when you work together to persuade your colleagues to accept your language as being perhaps more diplomatic or more all-encompassing, you've just achieved what you want to do. You've advanced your interests while persuading them to accept them. Next, countries do not have friends, only interests. Uh, president de Gaulle was allegedly told that to uh, John F. Kennedy, as president, when he was getting involved in Indochina. If you remember, France quit Indochina after many bloody years of war in the 50s. Um, that same example, a country doesn't have friends but has interests, can be shown in the recent spat between France and the United States because Australia chose to change their submarine contract for $50 billion from France to the United States. <coughs> you might say, well, that's not fair. The French certainly did, but it was an economic decision. It was made by a sovereign nation, and they chose to switch to a U.S. contractor. But in the interest of, of having better relations, President uh, Biden ended up making a special phone call to President Macron and dispatching high-level uh, so, um, uh, administration officials to include Secretary Blinken to France to reaffirm our friendship as two countries. You can't ignore money. Money makes the world go round, said Joel Gray in the movie Cabaret. Every country, every citizen of every country simply desires to create a better life for themselves as well as for their children. That means money. And money means jobs, means economic development, can mean uh, protecting the environment, can mean uh, despoiling the environment. But economics rules so, much as so many aspects of diplomacy that you have to take it into account. Next slide, please. Mao Zedong, political power grows out of the barrel of a gun. Now, he came to power at a time when they were fighting Japan in China and trying to push them out of their country. But there's many other aspects where political power comes out of the barrel of a gun. And one example is uh, looking at Russia and Ukraine. Uh, President Putin basically took the Crimea from Ukraine because he could. He knew that nobody would, was going to come to Ukraine's aid to fight the Russians. 
If you notice, Secretary Blinken and President Biden have said repeatedly to Russia, right now as it masses over 120,000 troops on the Ukrainian border, they've threatened dire consequences. But do you notice that diplomatic language did not say that the United States is going to get involved in the, in the battle or the fray. So again, sometimes political power comes for, well, look what's going on in Kazakhstan, right? Even as we speak, Kazakhstan is, is undergoing a virtual revolution right now. And the, the president of Kazakhstan issued an order today saying his security forces have standing orders to shoot to kill anyone on site. Um, this is obviously not good for Kazakhstan. It's not good for Russia. Russia is sending in troops now to support the president there and uh, maintain his dictatorial grip on the country. In consequence, you also have uh, Mahatma Gandhi's The Three Principles of Satyagraha. And through nonviolence, uh, Mahatma Gandhi basically pushed uh, India into its freedom and uh, pushed the United Kingdom out. That's a great example of Martin Luther King Jr. did the same thing with the protests that he organized, all in peaceful demonstrations. But the issue was to not uh, to be willing to self-sacrifice and also refusal to harm others. Last, you have to, everyone, you know, pure and simple, beware of military force because it's always the last resort. When you have two sides talking, that means two sides are, are continuing to dialogue. That means they're not fighting. When they're fighting, then dialogue stops and then anything can happen. And uh, I'm a strong believer in, in, in dialogue as opposed to military action. I've seen military action in Afghanistan and Iraq, and I can honestly say I'd rather see dialogue and see, because war has really tremendous uh, unintended consequences. Next slide, please. I'm, I'm throwing this out because uh, uh, Bill Burns, who was uh, the deputy, deputy Secretary of State as well as a professional diplomat and Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs, these were the two and the number two and number three positions in the State Department. When he gave a retirement speech, and it's on the web, you can look it up. It's he, he gave ten points, ten parting thoughts on American diplomacy. Well, you could substitute any country's name for diplomacy, for Mexican, uh, French, whatever diplomacy, because the points that he makes are universal. And they're very good practical, common sense uh, uh, advice on, on the conduct of diplomacy and also on, on the thinking that goes behind our actions. So I commend that to you because it's easy to retrieve and you might find it very beneficial no matter what career you choose in the future. Next slide, please. So I can honestly say I've learned a lot. Uh, I've made many mistakes. Uh, I admit them freely. But the most important thing I've tried to do is to learn from them. And I urge you to do the same. Is don't be afraid to make uh, hard decisions. Make sure you have the reasons and your, 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 your solid knowledge and data that you need to base your decisions on. But we all make mistakes, unfortunately. Sometimes a decision goes awry, but that's, that's OK. The most important thing is that you learn from them. Admiral Nimitz, right up here in Fredericksburg, they have a museum to him. Admiral Nimitz was the uh, architect of our, ultimately, the naval war in World War II against Japan. And at one point, uh, there's this anecdote where a ship was, he, he was the admiral in charge of the fleet, but he's not the captain of the ship. But he was on the bridge, and this ship came into dock, and it scraped the, uh, the side of the dock. And the, the officer, it was not the captain, but the officer who was in charge of that, uh, Nimitz said very quietly to him, uh, like, Commander, you, you, you understand the mistake you made, correct? And the commander replied, yes. And that's, that's all he left it at, you see? He, he didn't punish him. He just said, well, no, you've learned from that experience. Uh, that, that happens throughout your career. And, and having a good boss and a good mentor to help you understand your decision process is very, very beneficial no matter where you're at. 
When I was in the military, I learned the second phrase, have confidence without arrogance, and not the reverse. Uh, you, we've all encountered arrogant people, sometimes uh, totally undeserved. They, they had no right to be. Uh, you know, you can figure that out. But the main point is have confidence in yourself. And the best confidence you can get is that which you gain from those experiences you make and the mistakes you learn from. Last, education, 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 yeah. You will always benefit by learning solid data, information, base it on good reasoning, talk to many people, get the opposing views, but be very careful of misinformation, be very careful of disinformation. Be very precise in what you say when you talk about the information you share. Learn, in other words, from the experts. And, uh, and truly, I think our country right now is facing major issues with disinformation, which is causing so much confusion. Next slide, please. The law of unintended consequences happens all the time. You, you think you're gonna predict ABC is gonna happen as a result of your decision process, and instead XYZ happens. Just be aware of it. Always think of what can happen in terms of the alternative results so that you're, you're safe in terms of, of estimating what your risks are when you make a decision. President Ronald Reagan, in his dealings with Gorbachev, which helped bring down, essentially, the breakup of the Soviet Union, he used the phrase, trust but verify. That meant we can negotiate with the Russians. We can, it's in our mutual interest to do so. You know, it, uh, the, they always say the best uh, negotiated agreement is that one which both sides walk away a little bit unhappy because not everybody is supposed to get 100% of what they want. But when two sides get close to what they want and they're willing to accept differences, that's how you work. That's what's going on right now in the discussions with Iran and over its, uh, its uh, nuclear energy programs. It, 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 these are very hard decisions, but the most important aspect is, are we advancing our national interests uh, in the, for the benefit of both, both our security as well as international security? Um, I personally believe sincerity cuts through everything, whether it's in a personal relationship with your family, friends, whatever but also in diplomacy, because when you've gained your colleagues' trust in terms of what you're, what you're explaining to them or what you're trying to convey to them, that trust is critical, because then they know that they can rely upon the message, that you're not really trying to feed them a line that, to get them to do something they don't want to do. I found that it was very important for me to have a very strong personal relationship with my colleagues, because then they trusted me, and if I said, well, this, I'll give you an example. When we would have, I was a Romania desk officer for two years. Romania was desperately trying to get into NATO and the European Union. I served as an honest broker. My job at the, at the State Department was to, to speak frankly to the Romanian embassy so they knew exactly what's going on, and also advise and write the papers for our principals when they met with their foreign minister or prime minister. And uh, they valued that because they knew they could trust when we would come out of a meeting with the secretary or the deputy secretary, and we'd go downstairs to the lobby of the State Department before the foreign minister would take off, and then I'd pull them aside and say, okay, yes, Secretary Colin Powell was very nice and very gentle. Here's the real message. Like, th this is what we're really trying to tell you, what we want to see, what we need to see, if we want our support to get into NATO. So they learned to trust my word for precisely that reason, that I could cut through nuance and make sure they understood the message. You guys are young. Believe in yourself, believe in your mission, trust your gut instincts. Trust that you have the, the, the good common sense. Remember, common sense is not so common. But if you have good common sense, you have good data, good information, you've researched it, but something doesn't seem quite right in the way maybe a discussion is going, trust that gut instinct of yours. And the other thing is don't rush uh, into thinking just because, oh my God, I, I've got to choose my career now, I've got to choose my career path. No, you don't. Your 20s are your best years of your life to get better education. I hope college is in your future. But at the same time, 
to travel and see the world. Get out there and be a part of that world so you learn from it and they learn from you. I, I really encourage you to, do, to think very carefully about that. Don't commit yourselves to, to automatically that career unless you know that is your true love. And then last but not least, which leads me to what I say, love what you do. Try to help others because helping others, our world's overpopulated as it is, we're now facing a pandemic, it's killing millions. The main point is, you, you, if you love what you do, and you love your career, and you love helping others, you'll always be rewarded in your future uh, lives. If you're interested, and for those, again, uh, US citizens interested in a job at the State Department, there's multiple websites to look at. State.gov is one. But I mean, it's not just state. The Commerce Department advances U.S. national exports. Uh, U.S. Trade Representative's Office, his job is to negotiate uh, trade treaties and remove barriers to trade. Remember, I was talking about economics. <coughs> Department of Defense, one of the largest defense uh, agent, oh, excuse me, one of the largest departments in the entire U.S. government, has multiple jobs of multiple uh, different responsibilities uh, and. Many times you're serving as a, you can be a military diplomat, what's called a foreign area officer. Even the CIA and other aid, intel, intel agencies, their job is to analyze what's new and what's important. The other thing I'd advise you when, you, when you're actually writing well, remember, writing skills are critical, learning how to summarize. But I mean, information, when you're passing it up to policymakers, information has to be fresh, fresh, fresh as fresh as fish, because three days and it's too old and situations change. So you have to be able to, if you meet someone, you learn something important, something that the ambassador needs to know or something that the secretary needs to know or the government, our US government needs to know. Your job is to summarize it and get it back to the policymakers so that they can have that information and use it. One of the great uh, ironic compliments I got when I was in uh, the mission to the European Union, was if you remember the famous WikiLeak, WikiLeaks cables got published. <laughs> I, I, I think our State Department instructions were we're supposed to refer to them as the alleged State Department cables. Anyway, the one thing I heard from my friends was, "Boy, you guys really write very well," you know. But the other thing they would tell me is, "Don't put my name in your damn cables." So <laughs> I learned to uh, to. Uh, to always address about an official in, as opposed to Mr. Timothy Smith or something like that. Um, again, I had a tremendous time in my career. I loved it. Uh, I retired a year ago. Uh, I'm a worker, a public servant like many. Uh, I was not a title. Uh, I've negotiated with Russians. I've helped rescue US hostages abroad. I prepared papers up and down the chain for uh, principals in the United States. I've worked with Congress. That's also an honor, is when you're able to educate our congressmen when they come abroad. All these jobs are there, and they're there for you. You can get them just as easily as I did, which is I worked hard at it, and I kept, as I, as I said, P for persistence. I kept taking the Foreign Service exam until I passed it. But it was the career I loved. It kept me entertained, you know, all the waking hours for 28 years. And I think you guys could have as much fun in whatever careers you choose in the future, too. So I, I think we still have a little bit of time. And I, would, I welcome, if you guys have any questions, I'd be happy to share some anecdotes with you, too. Uh, one time we had President Bush visiting President Putin. And uh, in 2001, to give you an idea, Bush said about Putin, he said, I looked into his eyes and I thought he was trustworthy and, and I could see into his soul. Now, Vice President Biden in 2011, he met with then Prime Minister Putin and he said to Putin, he said, well, when I look in your eyes, I don't see a soul. And President Putin replied, well, then we understand one another. That's true. <laughs> so, you have many, many levels of diplomacy, and even, even uh, at that level, sometimes uh, they can pull little tricks on you. And one thing I'll tell you is uh, you can have a lot of fun in this career. 
and you get a lot of variety, a lot of countries. Okay, so if any of you'd like, I can take some questions and I'd be happy to try and answer them as best as I can add to your confusion. Yes. Say again, sir. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting. That's a good comment. Thank you. Um, it was ironic because, uh, as I, I might have mentioned before, forgive me, I did this talk before. My father's first assignment was Poland, and I went there when I was 12 years old. And 25 years later, my first assignment as a diplomat was Poland and when I was 37 years old. Uh, the State Department is a believe, they believe the Foreign Service officers, we're supposed to be what are called generalists, <clears throat> because we're supposed to be able to do whatever is required. If you lose your passport overseas, you'll be seeing me. If you, uh, when we pass messages, diplomats pass messages, you could be back in Washington and taking notes for the secretary at a meeting or you could be uh, organizing a congressional delegation and traveling. The, 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 the actual practice was not different. The cultures are different. That's where you have to, and we, we were given a chance to study the local languages and culture. For example, when I went to Poland, I had to take six months of Polish language so that I could be language uh, uh, proficient. And we don't, the way we evaluate language skills, it's in reading, and in uh, speaking, not writing. That language, those language lessons lasted six hours a day, five days a week for six months. And sometimes it can go for a year. Or for Arabic and Chinese, for example, it can go two years to actually know so you can address the issues. Before I went to Tunisia, I had to do regional studies of the, not only the, the Maghreb, the north, northern part of the uh, Arab League, if you will, along the Mediterranean. Uh, I had to take cultural lessons as well as uh, history lessons of that region. But I also had to study French then for six months so that I could be able to, to negotiate and talk with uh, Tunisians. Um, as generalists, you learn to be flexible because that's what your job is. It's to be ready. I mean, I've known some of my colleagues one day or are dealing with a congressional delegation, and the next day they're, say, evacuating Americans from a like from, like under, excuse me, under this pandemic. It was the State Department that brought back hundreds of thousands of Americans from around the world and they organized those plane rides. You know, you may just get yanked in and suddenly your, your job is to bring back Americans, bring them back home. Um, I found it actually more of a challenge, uh, an intellectual challenge to learn and it was more fun. It made the job, uh, the, the whole career, more fun to know, well, I'm going from uh, an internal land country, Warsaw and Krakow, Poland, to uh, Tunis, which was on the Mediterranean. And if you ever get a chance to live in a city on the Mediterranean, please take it. I encourage you. Yes? Well, how long, much time do you have? Um, number one is when you join the State Department, you are asked three questions uh, before they'll admit you. Number one is you have to, and, and the answers are automatic. Number one is they'll say, have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? To which you have to reply, no. The second question is, have you ever been a member of an organization pledged to overthrow the US government? Obviously, the answer to that is no. And the third question is, will you go wherever we send you? And then you say yes. So that's the first three automatics. Um, you, the, one of the things that you're also required is, can you support US policies that may go contrary to your personal beliefs? Well, 
your answer to that is yes. Your job is to advance national interests, not your personal interests. So in advancing your national interests, for example, the United States is the largest arms dealer in the world. We make a lot of money selling weapons to other countries. Now, my question, you know, if, they, if you are ethically opposed to that, then really you should not accept a position with the U.S. government. Um, you can, we act, just so you know, uh, the United States State Department has what's called a dissident channel. And a dissident channel is allows any officer to write to the secretary and basically say, I disagree with this policy. Like, I don't think this is the right policy we should be doing. Uh, that was done in both Chile and Argentina back in the uh, 1970s. They had, um, dip and, and, and in diplomats in Guatemala and elsewhere who wrote and disagreed with our uh, military, our emphasis on military assistance as opposed to uh, economic development assistance. I would also say to you is you, you learn, you, 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 can you support selling tobacco products? You know, uh, maybe no, but there are many American companies that make a lot of money for the United States uh, GDP with selling tobacco. Um, we don't advocate for tobacco, by the way. Not at all. We're, that's one thing that's off the books. On China, China is a, is a great nation. Uh, China uh, is, is a nation that we, we have to work with. I mean, the world depends on Chinese uh, involvement as much as, as they do U.S. involvement. China is a tremendously complex country. Um, it rides on the razor's edge of stability. Um, I can honestly say to you, my personal opinion is China is not omnipotent. Don't think of it as such. Razor's edge of stability is precisely because at a population of 1.4 billion, Yes, 400 million do make up the middle class, but that means there's one billion that do not. And that one billion is just as hungry to have every one of the jobs that you guys want to have someday. Just remember that. I told my three kids who all are successful in their own careers, I said, you need to work hard at your studies because there's a lot of countries out there where they're just chomping at the bit to get where you're at. So our most important thing is to recognize China's uh, strengths, its weaknesses, its, its, its sensitivities. And when I say that, I refer directly, for example, China refers to their century of shame, and that where they went into uh, essentially isolation, and they proceeded then to, remember, the opium wars? You had Britain, France, and Germany pushing opium into China just to benefit their balance sheets. So that China has much, and we have history ourselves where the United States not, should not necessarily be proud of. We have history that we need to learn from. And that's exactly what I said. Good judgment comes from experience and experience comes from bad judgment. So sometimes we make mistakes too, but the most important quality that comes out of those mistakes is that we learn from them and don't repeat them. That's what I, I would urge everybody to do. I can, I can take one more question if you want. No, that's it? We're done, okay. I wish you all really good luck. Um, thank you for sharing your stories and some of the knowledge you gained along the way. Um, we loved hearing about your interesting job 